this for the first time because he's recording it for air within the city of Rivera Beach on channel 18. So if you have any questions about whatever you hear tonight and you want to, you know, have them have it repeated, you can see it right there on the screen, okay? So good evening again and welcome to our um, home ownership workshop here hosted by Mayor Thomas Masters. I don't know how many of you who have, um, have recently moved here or may have lived here for a while or may be interested in relocating here after you hear this information tonight. But I'd like to share, tell you a little bit about the man who has been serving as this mayor of this beautiful waterfront city since 2007. He was first elected there and has been re-elected four times since that time. So I think that speaks volumes about how the residents feel about this man, Mayor Thomas Masters. So I think they feel this way mostly because he's a man that speaks up and stands up for the interest of the residents of this city. Like presenting home ownership workshops like this. This is not his first. He has put them on with the Urban League, the National Urban League. He has put them on with other nonprofit organizations and tonight with a for-profit organization. But he does things that matter to the residents. Um, this workshop is, is for people who are interested in buying or selling a home in Palm Beach County, anywhere within Palm Beach County. Mayor Masters has teamed up with the Wait Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County to help paint homes for residents of Riviera Beach. For those who cannot afford to or cannot physically do the painting for themselves, this is the mayor who has done that for them. Um, his senior golden years discount program is a program that has been um, touted for saving seniors 62 and older. I don't know how many of you might qualify, fall into that category, but if you're 62 and older, based on the program that the mayor has initiated since 2013, you would qualify to save from 15 to 50 percent of products and services for local businesses here. Those are some of the things that the mayor has done and implement it for the residents. The Mayor's Veteran Office of Veteran Affairs is one of only five in this entire country that has veterans helping veterans right out of the Mayor's office. There's, um, let's see. After that shooting in South Carolina, the mayor implemented a, uh, a forum, put on a public forum to help secure and provide more, more safety for churches and their congregations by um, giving them access to a grant to help buy security cameras for their congregations. So these are some of the things that the mayor has done and will continue to do um, during his leadership of this city as the mayor of the city. So without further ado, um, I would like to present to some and introduce to others, Mayor Thomas Masters. Thank you, Ms. Isaacs. Ms. Isaac is the chief of staff for the office of the mayor and in our office, as she kind of mentioned, we have veterans working on the day-to-day -day basis, serving veterans. We have seniors working, we have interns uh, from time to time. It's, it's really the people's office. But when she gives introductions like the one she gave tonight, I think she's telling me it's time for a raise and a promotion. <laughs> so we gotta make sure that happens. No, I'm just kidding. Before we go uh, any further, uh, there's a couple things that we need to do. Uh, one is every meeting that, that I convene, or try to convene, I never wanna open up without prayer. Uh, Pastor Walker is here. I'm going to ask Pastor Walker. We certainly greet Pastor uh, Nelson as well. Pastor Walker, if you would come and give us a short prayer. 
Yeah, not a sermon, just a little prayer. Oh, <laughs> yeah, pray, pray us up. All right, all right, all right. And then Let after the prayer, if you would take a couple minutes and talk about the march on Saturday, no, October 10th. 10th. Okay. okay. All right. Let us all look to the hills from which cometh our help. Our help is coming from the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this meeting tonight. Lord, we pray that everyone here receive the grant that's needed to give them a home. If they want to sell one, that they sell at home. Lord, just put the anointing in this whole room. Uh, let the people on the panel go back and search in their inward man and make sure they give us everything we need to know about buying a home. Do it for us, Father. We know you can do it. Uh, and we ask you this in the mighty name of Jesus. Okay. Amen. 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 All right. Well, that now, was good and short. Yeah, I got me short. It was great. <laughs> okay, talk about the what's coming up on, on Saturday since this will be shown many times before Saturday. Okay, praise the Lord. Let me tell you something. Can I talk to you? I want to look at you. Can I look at you? you okay. Three Hold minutes. Okay. Excuse That's fine. Okay, let me look at you. You know, on this Saturday at 10 o'clock, there are going to be 100-plus uh, men in brown and 100-plus women in white, but wear what you want to wear, okay? That's just that's something we were just doing. But, you know, we have had a lot of violence in our communities. And, you know, we are walking to tear the kingdom of Satan down. But when marching, we want to have a solution. We just want to march in that city and say bye. But at Wells Park, we're going to have people over there with research information, you know, uh, Healthy mothers and healthy babies won't be there, but they're going to have a, a table there. Ms. Vernon from uh, LPNL, you need to know about them. You know, you really need to know how good they are to you, even though they'll cut your lights off. They're still good. They have a program in there that will help you when you need to be helped. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, this is for everybody of color, everybody, because we all have the same blood. Do you know it? Okay, you know that. All right, so we're looking to have all of you there on Saturday. They're going to be doing a million march, me and march in Washington. But we're going to do a hundred plus men and a hundred plus women. We're going to walk because we're walking for our family. We're walking because we're walking for our children. And guess what? We are walking, fighting in the England man, saying, you know, we're going to tear it down because these are our children that you're trying to take away from us because they're all our children. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. So just don't talk about it. Let's do something about it. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell everybody. Let's go out. And when we go out, we're going to be fighting in the England man and tearing down, telling Satan, you know you won't have it anymore, Pastor Walker, and we I won't have it, it anymore. Pastor, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> She'll start preaching, so I got to call the name three times. And Jesus called Peter three times. Peter, Peter, Peter. <laughs> Ms. Walker. Also, um, I want to recognize and, and ask them to come. Debbie, if you can make sure they get the, the, we get the court this mic up here as well. But um, nothing happens in the, in the city unless the council approves it, sanctions it, period. We run the city, they do. Basically, I am just the ambassador of goodwill, and I help to execute and carry out the policies. But we are blessed to have two young people up, up here with the mayor, helping us on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Um, Councilman Terrence Davis, I'm gonna ask if he would come and greet you, but even by the mere fact that we're in this room, um, certainly says that he sanctioned that. You know, I couldn't just do it. We can't do things by ourselves. We have to have support. Councilman Terrence T.D. Davis, give him a hand, please, if you will. First of all, I want to say good afternoon, good evening, good night, because I will not be with you as you leave this room. Mm -hmm. um, it's so wonderful that the mayor has these wonderful opportunities in these great events. This recently, uh, he supported a restoration of rights and expunging event we just had here at City Hall this past Saturday from 10 to 2. We will have a consistent number of these events because the outcome and the cry out for this was a great success. Um, attorney law firm Edwin Ferguson was there. Um, Craig Lawson law firm was there. And we also had the Malcolm Cunningham Bar Association that was there. So we had about 200 people that showed that turned out and it was a wonderful event. We had a wonderful time. People had an opportunity to learn what was the difference between expunging your record versus restoring your rights. And so keep watching Channel 18. We're going to keep having events like this. Um, Dr. Osgood was a school board representative out of Broward County. She was a young lady who was hooked on crap for about three years and got her life back together and got her rights restored. And she talked about just showing up to help yourself. 
and events like this in this workshop, I'd like to commend our great mayor for, for asking you to come just show up and find out what are the resources that you need to help yourself and to take back and help everybody else. So thank you all today for showing up to this great event. Thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to be here. And thank you once again, Mayor, for inviting me up to the microphone and sharing this moment with you. Glad to have you. Thank you, Councilman Davis. We also have a council lady that I, I call her my daughter because I really feel that way, uh, like a father, another father to her because she's um, is new and um, I've tried to be there for her, give her support and help uh, with, you know, making sure she is on top of things and continue um, the, the platform that she uh, became an elected official on and she'll, I'll call her and, you know, we'll talk from time to time about uh, the city and how we continue to work together. Um, and I'm really glad to see her uh, here tonight because she purchased her home at 25, I think that's 24, at 24 years of age. So I know she just got here from school. She's a, a assistant principal at Bear Lakes Middle School. So let's welcome um, Kashamba Miller Anderson as she greets you. We, we elected her, we put her in the office. Come on, let's give her a big hand as she comes. She's very modest, so she's going to be soft-spoken for one minute. For one that's, minute, That's You're all right. she's going to talk. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for saying the whole name, Mayor Masters. He's adjusting to the new merit name. He doesn't want to accept it. He said, I'm still Miller. There's I'm Miller Anderson now. Um, it's good to see everyone out here this evening. Um, I just got off of work, as he said, not too long ago. But you're in the right place because I remember, like he said, I, I was 24 when I purchased my home, and I'm still in my home. Um, but I, I, you know, I know we didn't have a class like this to go over the things that you need to do and what you need to have in order to purchase your home. I kind of fumbled my way through it, but I knew that was what I needed to do because I had a young son at the time, and he was about eight years old at that time. Um, <clears throat> what I do know is that you being here tonight is showing that you have a, a serious concern about being a homeowner. As you know, renting, you pay more money when you rent than you do when you purchase your home and pay a mortgage. So I encourage you to continue to come out, get the information. I, I hope that many of you get what you need tonight so that you are a homeowner. Um, and I applaud Mayor Masters for having this event tonight. He's always trying to do things for the community, um, always looking out for everyone. On October 17th, I will be having a town hall meeting here at the Chambers. It's going to be on a Saturday at 11 a.m., so if you have any other um, relatives or friends that live in the neighborhood, please invite them to come out. We'll be talking about the code enforcement issues, talking about the water billing issues, um, also about our crime rate. We'll have the police here that will be having um, some answers for you possibly. I know they're working on a strategic plan for the crime that we've been here about for the past few weeks. So again, congratulations, and I appreciate you all allowing me to come up and speak for a moment, but you're doing the right thing, and I wish everyone good luck. Thank you. Okay, last, last but not least, as we prepare to, to transition into the, uh, the order of the evening, as you know, there's been a very devastating um, hurricane and after effects in the Bahamas, and the Bahamian government has reached out to, to the office of the mayor for relief and for help. So we are opening up two fire stations in Riviera Beach, fire station number one, which is here on the campus at City Hall, and the fire station on Singer Island. They're in desperate need as we speak uh, for water, um, personal hygiene items, linen. Those are the three major things. And I'll be contacting lumber companies for lumber. So please keep them in mind. If you have any of these items, you want to purchase them, get them to us. The mayor will be leading the delegation to Nassau, Bahamas, November the 1st. And we're not just going to send stuff. We're taking it. And we're going to distribute it to the people that need it the most. So please pray for that initiative. Please help us to be responsive. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to respond to others when they're in the need because, you know, we face hurricanes all the time in hurricane season. And in, God forbid, if something happens here, we're going to need all the help we can get. So when you sow a seed, you reap a harvest. So if you help others, others will help you when you are uh, in need as well. Tonight, as we come to 
first time homeowner, home buyer, seller workshop. Let me just say a couple things to sort of set the stage. With a reputation for wild swings and frightening free falls, the Florida economy is now in a period of rapid ascent. Tourism is booming again, and a steady influx of retirees and international condo buyers has ushered the Sunshine State into an era of impressive growth. So we had the right time. That's a theme with Florida throughout our history. Boom and bust, says Palm Beach County Commissioner Steve, Stephen Abrams. In the recession, we suffered as badly as any part of the country, he says, but we have caught up. Florida's unemployment rate, according to the United States Bureau of Labor, statistics has soared to 11.4% during the Great uh, Repression, recession, rather. but by mid-year 2014, it had dropped to 6.2% with Florida gaining more than 208,000 new jobs over the 12-month period that ended last July, placing it third behind only Texas and California, where I'm from, California. According to the executive director of the Florida Department of Economic Opportunity, we are a growing state right now. Florida has a remarkable economic turnaround. Home prices are up and foreclosures are down. Oh, however, one foreclosure is one too many, okay? Our residential markets also have been recovering from one of the nation's most infamous real estate bubbles. Our home prices were devastated. A recent report released by the University of Central Florida shows the medium home price in Florida fell 48% in the peak in 2006. It was 258,000. Housing hit rock bottom in, in 2010 before rising from the dead. The current medium home price in this state is around $177,000. So what's happened in the last four years is amazing. We have seen both the highs and the lows in the housing market in Palm Beach County. Not only are investors coming into the market, but finally, we're being reintroduced to first-time home, home buyers again. And last but not least, and if you're one of them, it's important to understand the importance of being financeable, and you must know what level of credit you are eligible for so you can look at the homes at the right price. I am so blessed tonight, and I am so thankful for a young lady who came to our office and said, Mr. Mayor, uh, can we put on uh, a seminar, a symposium, like we are tonight? And I said, well, yeah, you do it. You do the work, and I'll talk, and uh, I'll make it happen. So Deborah McLaughlin has done the work. She has assembled a panel of experts that are here freely to give you information. Information is powerful of what you need to know from fixing your credit to whatever to make you eligible and to tell you whatever you need to uh, share with. And also there will be question and answers, one-on-one, -on -one, whatever, however we do it. So I'm just going to step aside and not take credit for any of this tonight and give all the credit to the young lady who put this together, Deborah McLaughlin. Give her a big hand, and she's gonna come and take it from here. Deborah, why don't you take this seat? Well, you, you good. No, I'm good right here, okay. thank you. That's fine. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm soft spoken. Um, I really would like to thank the mayor for allowing us to um, make this presentation for you all. As official as this all looks, this is very um, personal for me and for most of my panel, we just want to be there for you all, help you through the process, and let you help you to understand that it's not difficult and you can do it. I'd like to first introduce the panel. These gentlemen have all um, been right there for me and they've uh, proven themselves over and over and I'm actually going to let them, the mayor was going to introduce them, but I'm gonna actually let them kind of tell a little bit about themselves, I'll give them um, introduce their name and um, let you know what company they're from and what they do and that sort of thing. But I'm going to let them speak for themselves. And first we have down on the end, we have Mikhail Rajner. He's with Movement Mortgage. Um, Mikhail is going to speak for himself and I'll let you go ahead and tell a little bit about yourself now, Mikhail. Thanks. How's everybody doing? Good to see you. Thanks, uh, Mayor, for having us out tonight. It's real exciting to be here, and uh, thanks, Deborah, for inviting me. Deborah's a very special lady, and I've had an opportunity to work with her off and on over the last year, 
and uh, she's she's really top notch. So my name's Mikhail. I'm I'm in the mortgage business. I uh, help you get financing for home loans. I know that sounds really exciting, but actually it's one of the most painful experiences you're ever going to go through in your life. <laughs> but I do my best to try and make it as palatable as possible. And uh, Movement Mortgage is really what I like to talk about. Movement Mortgage is a company that actually was born in 2008, right after the Great Recession hit. And we were born uh, to completely revolutionize the industry. And our mission statement starts with a very powerful sentence, and it simply says that we exist to love and value people. So when you work with Movement Mortgage, you can rest assured that we have your best interests in mind, and we'll work our little tails off to make sure that you get exactly what it is you need. And sometimes you need financing, and other times you need education, and we're very excited to help you on both fronts. So again, Mikhail with Movement Mortgage. Thank you, Mikhail. And next we have Keith Abrine, Abrinhein, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But Keith is with Debt Helpers, and I've worked with Keith a number of times, and he has a wealth of resources. Keith. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor for inviting us down and for Deborah for putting this together. Uh, <clears throat> Mikhail, Deborah, and I have done a few of these uh, seminars, and we seem to work well together. Uh, my company uh, that I work for is debthelper.com. We're a local company. We've been in business. We've been in the area for 20 years. Uh, our offices are right next to the Outlet Mall uh, in the Chase Bank building on the corner of uh, North Congress and Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard. What we do, you know, I sat down one day and I made a list. We have about 14 or 15 different services that we provide to the public. We're a nonprofit. We, the services basically fall into two categories. One is financial education and the other is housing counseling. And we do believe that education is power. We believe that if people have been properly educated, I don't think that the meltdown would have been as severe. And I certainly know that if you're educated, we won't fall into the same problems as we've had before. Uh, very quickly, we have two services for current homeowners. So if you own a home now, you're, finance, you're facing a financial hardship, we will assist you for a modification. If somebody in your family, your friends, anyone that you know, please call us. This is a free service that we do. We're funded through HUD, through the government, so there is no fee to you. We help with the application. We help with gathering the documents, and then we submit the application to the bank. So we're here on your behalf as your advocate. All right. The second program is something called the Hardest Hit Fund, where the federal government gave the state government money, and we can help you become current, possibly do a principal reduction. I always like to mention those two uh, programs. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Mm -hmm. I need both of them. <laughs> <laughs> And you all know the mayor, right? <laughs> well, beside me we have Edwin Ferguson. I was, it was a pleasure for me to meet him. Um, him and one of his um, sidekicks came to my office and we had a really good talk and um, kind of got to know each other. Keith is, I mean, I'm sorry, Edwin is with the Ferguson firm here in Riviera Beach. Edwin? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mayor Masters, for putting this on in conjunction with Deborah. I'm an attorney. I am located here in Riviera Beach. Uh, my primary area of practice is in real estate. Uh, I think it's very important, particularly in regard to what some of the other speakers said, for persons to educate themselves sooner than later when it comes to buying a home. So in that regard, I definitely applaud you all for taking the time to invest in yourselves and come out here tonight. Um, I won't be long because I'm sure you'll have, we'll have plenty of time over the course of the evening to get into specifics. Uh, but again, I am an attorney. Uh, we handle the real estate uh, closings for you. We do the investigation work for you. That's called the title searches, and I'm sure we'll get we'll have a, more than ample opportunity to get into that over the course of this evening. But again, thank you all for coming out, uh, and I'm, again, thanks to Mayor Masters and for Deborah for putting this on. Thank you. Okay, um, a little bit about myself. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you, Edwin. 
A little bit about myself. My name is Deborah McLaughlin, and I'm a real estate agent, and I've been licensed since 2001. Um, I got licensed here in Florida initially, and I also have um, my license in Georgia. So I came down here. I rushed down here nine months pregnant. Okay, I was eight months pregnant. <laughs> um, but I quickly got my license when I moved to um, Florida. I was here for five years and went back to Georgia and got my license there as well. I have continuously worked in the real estate field, and I really, really, really enjoy it. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started, and we're not going to start. We're not going in any specific order. We're just here, and I just want you guys to be comfortable. Make sure you write down your notes, write down your questions. Um, if they don't cover whatever questions that you come up at the end, we will. We want it to be kind of private and kind of intimate for that part of it. Uh, we don't want that part to be broadcast, so we're going to have the question and answer, and we'll actually come down and talk to you guys one on one and um, take the questions from the floor. So we're going to start actually with Keith, um, and he will get your pre get the presentation ready. And if you guys all need an ink pen or something to write with, there are pens over on the table. Uh, Victor, Sophia, if you can take some pens around for me. That's my daughter. That's my youngest daughter. Did I tell you guys I have five children? She's my youngest. She's 14 years old, and she goes to school right here over at Inlet. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Keith? All right, thank you again. You. What I wanted to talk about is some of the basics. Uh, and, you know, the question I always ask is, you know, where do you start if you're going to be buying a home? And my answer is let's start with a budget. Let's start to make sure that we can save a few dollars, that we've got our expenses under control, and we'll be able to afford the home. To me, and having been through, the, I call it the meltdown, sustainability is important. Um, owning a home is very important, not only for the obvious reasons of accumulating wealth. The studies have also found that children who grow up in a home that's owned are healthier, better educated, and more successful in life. So not only are you doing it for yourselves, but you're doing it for your children. So what I did was I left a handout for a budget. It's very simple. Just go through it, and you can put your expenses, you put your income, and do a simple math to see where you're at. And then the second column deals with your goal and what you want to accomplish. And we can track it every, we can track it every month. I will offer to everybody who's here the opportunity to call our office and we have a gentleman there by the name of Alexander Borge. He's at extension 8031. And Alexander works with budget and credit counseling and also with financial coaching. So if you need a little help, a little push to sit, <clears throat> Alex will work with you. Alex has the budget in Excel, and we can help you get it prepared. Once we have the budget, <clears throat> the next step is your credit report. I think you're gonna hear a lot about your credit. I know this is everybody's favorite topics. Uh, and I have a question uh, for everybody here. Has everybody seen your own credit report in the last three months? How many of you have actually seen your credit report? I've got two people, three, all right. So it looks like about 20, 25% of the people, and that's great. What I always recommend when you go home tonight or tomorrow, go to www.annualcreditreport.com and pull one of your credit reports. It's free. There are three different credit reporting agencies and you're allowed to pull one every year. What we recommend is that you pull one every four months. This way you can track to see if there's any mistakes on your credit report. You can track to see how well you're doing. Once you have a copy of the credit report, we can work with you and develop a credit action plan. 
We can work with you to increase your score. You're gonna hear Mikhail is gonna have certain programs, have certain needs, certain credit scores. We can work with you to try to achieve those scores. You're gonna need those for your down payment assistance. So it's very important that we look and we see that there's accurate information. The other reason that people don't, <clears throat> that I always like to explain to people is your credit report is very important in other areas of your life. Every time you apply for a job and fill out that job application, on the bottom, if you read it carefully, you're giving the prospective employee the right to pull your credit report. So it could affect whether you get a job or not. The other area where it comes into play is with your insurance. Whether you're buying insurance for your home, insurance for your car, life insurance, the premium that an insurance company will charge is based in part upon your credit score. So it's another area where we can help reduce your expenses. And it's something that you really, I can't stress the importance of having an accurate credit report. There is a way to dispute your credit report. What do you do if you look at the credit report and there's something wrong or you disagree? Step one would be to dispute it, send a letter to Macy's or whoever has the misinformation. Step two would be then to report it to the agencies. You can have a dispute letter. Again, uh, I can get you a copy of a dispute letter. We can tell you what should be in it. Uh, and again, I'll be staying after the panel. If there's any individual questions that you might have, we'll be more than glad to answer them for you. But it's important to dispute it. And you also have the right to put your own statement with your credit report. So if you had a merchandise dispute, you bought a pair of shoes, you returned them, you had a disagreement with the shoe salesman, and they're insisting that this derogatory credit stays, you have the right to put your side of the story on so that anybody later on who looks at your credit report will be able to see and hear your side of what actually happened. I always like to caution people about co-signing. Yeah, that, that's another one of those words that everybody loves. I work with Chase Bank and I ran their modification office here in Palm Beach Gardens for six years. And I can't tell you how many wonderful people came in and said, you need to help me. Sure, come on in, you're in the right place, what can I do? I co-signed for a mortgage for my son or my daughter. I said, you're a wonderful parent. But what you did was you guaranteed to the bank that you would pay the mortgage if your child didn't make the payment. And now you're coming to me or the bank came to you and said your child is not making the payment, please pay. So it's something that you have to be very careful with. I'm sure Edwin may have a few words on co-signing and when to do it, uh, but it is a legal document, it's a legal responsibility, and it's gonna be very difficult to overcome that down the road. I th <clears throat> Basically, what I always like to say, and uh, I'm gonna start to bring my presentation to a close, is that I left a handout. I always believe that buying a home should be a happy time. And I, and I get upset when people have problems and issues along the way. And again, I congratulate everybody for being here to learn the process, how to get a mortgage, how to buy a house, and we'll prevent the problems and it will be a happy time. I always have a little saying that buying a home is easy as one, two, three. One, let's get your credit in order using an agency like mine if you need it. Two, we go over to Mikhail as the loan officer. He's the one with the money. And three, once we have that, then you go over to Deborah and say, this is the amount 
of uh, purchase price that I can afford, and I want a million dollar house on the water, <laughs> and go find it for me. So she has the most difficult job. The biggest mistake people make, and maybe I'm talking to the wrong people because you are here learning, people go to step three, then step two, then step one. They do it backwards. They go out and find the house first, and I want that house. And then they come to Mikhail and say, get me the money. And then Mikhail sends them to me and says, Keith, you have to work on the credit first. And there's some issues that we have to take care of. And then, unfortunately, what happens is you lose that house, that dream house. So we want to make sure that you do get the dream house. All right. I think I have covered all my checkpoints. So, Deborah, I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. Thank you. Let's give them a hand of applause. Okay, since we've gone through Keith and we've gotten our credit all straightened out, so we're credit, credit worthy, now we're going to go to Mikhail and let Mikhail tell us how much money we can spend. <laughs> okay, so when you walk into my office, first thing we're going to talk about is you. We're going to talk about what your goals are, a little bit about your life experiences, I need to try and understand exactly what it is you're trying to accomplish through home ownership. And after we talk a little bit about that, then we're going to talk about five really important things. The first thing is how much money do you have saved? There are very few times when you can truly buy a house and not invest any of your own money in that transaction. Uh, about the only time when it's possible is if you're a veteran. There are some situations where we can help veterans get into home, homes with practically no money out of pocket. But other than that, you're going to have to save. You're going to have to have funds that you can contribute towards a transaction. The next thing we're going to talk about is your job, what you do, where you work, how long you've been there. It's important that you have steady income. Because even if you have millions and millions of dollars in the bank, if you don't have a steady stream of income every month, it's gonna be very difficult for you to qualify for a mortgage. So we're gonna look at your income and see exactly how much you got and what the likelihood is of that income continuing into the future. The third thing we're gonna look at is your um, credit. And like he spoke to a few seconds ago, credit is important. And the level of credit score that you have is going to dictate, number one, whether or not you qualify for a loan in the first place, and number two, what level of interest rate you're going to qualify for. So your credit score is something that people look at, and they use that as a way to determine credit risk. So the minimum credit score that we're looking for to qualify for most programs is going to be somewhere between 620 and 680. There are programs available that will go as low as 580. That's the lowest you can go. But remember that if you're at 580, there's circumstances that have put you there, and it's going to be important that we look at it on a case-by-case -case basis, and most of the circumstances that contributed to that credit score are going to have to be addressed in some way. I do want to stress, though, that if you're sitting here tonight and your credit score is in the dumper, don't panic. Don't worry. There are very specific things that you can do immediately, actions that you can take to help fix it. <clears throat> the last thing we're gonna look at is the one that everybody wants to pretend like doesn't exist, and that is debt. We're gonna take a look at how many credit cards you have, how many installment debts, how many revolving debts, how many other loans, student loans. Pretty much every single debt that is reported on your credit report is gonna get added into what we call your debt to income ratio. And what we're basically doing there is we're taking all the money that you make each month and we're dividing that by all the required monthly payments that you have to make. So for example, if you make $10,000 a month, I wish, but for easy math, go with me on this. If you make 10,000 a month and yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> your total monthly required payments are 5,000. And that includes the car payment, that includes the credit card minimum payments, that includes the student debt payments, that includes the mortgage itself, that includes the homeowner's insurance that you have to have, that includes your taxes, that includes your homeowner's association if you're unlucky enough to have one. 
When you add all that in, let's say that that all adds up to $5,000. So when you take $5,000 and divide it by $10,000, that means your debt to income ratio is 50%. 50% is too high. About the most we can do is 45%. Again, there are certain, certain programs that allow higher. There are certain times whenever you have to have lower. But 45% is the number we're basically looking for. So using that 10000 as a figure, that means that your combined monthly required payments can only be 4500 So if you scale that back a little bit, and say we're only making 2000 a month, 45% of that would be $900. So your maximum monthly payments could only be $900. So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea how debt-to-income ratio works. So we, we'll start off, we'll have those conversations, and then we'll get into your, uh, the finer details of, of your financial well-being. And then we do one of two things. We either qualify you for a program or we educate you on exactly what you need to do next to get, the, um, to get your goals accomplished. That kind of gives you a little bit of an overview of what it takes to get a loan. Maybe I'll pass it back to Deborah now. Yeah, Deborah, let me, uh, yeah, I have a question. For the benefit of those who are, who are viewing, um, on television who are not here, you said if, if a person has bad credit, not to panic because there's some things that can, that can be done to fix it or to get you back on the right track. Absolutely. Can you kind of give us an idea what maybe a couple of those, some of those things are? I know people here sure. will hear later, but it would be good to educate the public who are not here. Absolutely. You know, you can, um, you can ignore it, and you can beat it up, and you can be bad to it, and can do everything you want to it, but, but it will stick with you forever, your credit score, your credit. It's not going anywhere. So if you've, if you've been bad to it and you've mistreated it, at some point you got to make amends and you got to accept responsibility for whatever it is. And you got to get with um, professionals like the gentleman next to me who can help guide you and repair it, repair that relationship, if you will. And really that's it. It's just like any relationship in life. You know, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not so good. But ultimately, it's our own responsibility to fix it. So some specific things that you can do That's what I'm looking for. is contact your creditors. <laughs> Anybody who you have uh, uh, not a great relationship with, maybe the ones you've ignored or the ones you've stopped paying, contact them. Remember that on the other end, there's, there's a real person there, believe it or not. And uh, while companies are not people, there are decisions being made that... Uh, can help you settle debt, sometimes for pennies on the dollar, to help satisfy that past obligation. So that's like negotiating with the creditor. Correct. To yeah. get it down. Exactly. That's one. Exactly. Okay. So another thing you can do is uh, get debts reinstated. You know, a lot of us went to school and got some student loans that we just couldn't quite keep up with. And now we're ready. Now we got our job. Now we got our income. Now we, we, we've done a lot of work in the day-to-day, -day, and we're ready to get it back on track. So student loans, you want to contact them and get them reinstated. Uh, they want you to pay that money back. And there are a lot of protections out there that ensure that they have to uh, reinstate them when you're ready, when you're able to get them reinstated. So that's another example. Um, another example is uh, just to take care of the relationships that you have maintained. Um, you know, there is no silver bullet when it comes to credit restoration or credit repair, and that is why it is always important to have a professional in your corner who can help guide you along the way. But it's a, uh, it's a, it's a uh, uh, deliberate and consistent effort um, that is taken to get your credit score where it needs to be. That was a couple. Um, I just wanted to, to address a little bit. Um, sometimes when we have things in our credit history, whether it's um, doctor's bills or student loans, we feel that it's so big, I cannot get out of it. Can you touch that a little bit on the doctor's bills and the student loans, um, Mikhail? Yeah, in relation to getting a, a loan, um, you know, medical debt is a, is a challenging thing, and, and I think everybody has a little bit of medical debt hanging around somewhere, if not a lot. Um, you know, one thing that is a benefit is that when you're qualifying for a loan, uh, in most situations, medical debt is not something that they're going to look at and use as a way to disqualify you for getting a mortgage. So if you do have a lot of medical debt in there, maybe you were, you know, so many situations that could have caused it, don't panic. That's a great thing for us to talk about in our one-on-one -on -one conversation. 
Um, uh, the second thing you talked about was medical debt. I'm sorry, Deborah. This student loans. Student loans. So again, with student loans, it's just important to understand that it's going to have to be paid back at, at some point. Um, there are uh, specific programs that our credit restoration uh, professionals can do sometimes to get certain student loan debt uh, re relieved, um, or more importantly, just to at least get it reinstated. And oftentimes when you reinstate the student debt, your payment structure is going to be designed to um, complement your income. So if you're, you know, if you're making a certain level of income, but the student loan companies are saying you still got to pay this much, what they'll do is they'll set you up on a type of a program that will um, only make you pay back a certain percentage of your income so that it's more uh, easily managed. Yeah, if I can add something to that. I think it's important to understand how they calculate your credit score. You know, what's the most important part of that? And for those of you who are here in the audience, there's a little handout with a pie chart. 35% of your score, about one third, is your payment history. I always view credit score as your willingness to repay a loan that somebody else gave you. So if I'm a, looking to lend you money, whether it's Mikhail's bank or um, one of the car dealers, how did you handle it? So specifically, I've seen a lot of times where somebody might be 30 days late on their Macy's bill. I look at it and I tell them immediately, you have to bring it current. So if you're behind, bringing it current will have a very positive impact on your score right away. The second most important part is the amount that you owe. So if you have a Macy's card, and, and well, let me retract that. What the credit agencies do is they add together all of your open credit cards and debt together to see how much credit you're allowed to have versus how much you actually have. So if you have $100 of combined credit and you've got, you're using $98 of it, that has an adverse effect. If you're allowed to have 100 and you're at 102, that's devastating. It means you're overdrawn on your credit cards. So I tell people either pay $10 to decrease it so that you'll be below what you have, or call your credit agencies, the Macy's card, and ask them to raise your limit. Now, I don't want you to raise the limit if you're just going to go spend more money and go over the limit again. <laughs> then we're getting into a, a catch-22. But those are some of the areas, and that's why it's so important, you know, to pull your credit report, look at it. There's certain strategies. I've had people say to me, ah, oh, you're going to be so proud of me, Keith. I pulled my credit, I looked at it, and all those credit cards I never used, I closed them. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> were they good pieces of credit? Yes. Did they have a long credit history, open for 10 years? Yeah. I said, well, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but that hurts your credit score. For one reason, now you have less credit. So when we look at that ratio, the other is, if you look at the yellow, it's 15% of your score is the length of the credit. So if you have an old piece of credit that's good, leave it alone. The other point that I make is, your derogatory credit will stay with you for seven years. The exception is bankruptcy, which will stay on for 10 years. So if you have a collection account, and people come to me all the time, I have a collection account, what should I do? I, I give everybody the same answer. It depends. How old is it? Is it six years, 11 months, and three weeks? See me next week. <laughs> we don't have to do anything. It'll be gone. The caution is that if at that point you pick up the phone and say, I want to try to work something out, it's going to start a new seven-year period. It goes from the date of last activity. So be very careful. The other advice I give people is if you're going to do a settlement on your own, get it in writing because these collectors are on a commission, 
okay? And just to, if I can step back and to answer one of the other questions, if you find yourself and you're in a position having difficulty making your credit card payments, again, it's, you'll find I'm easy as one, two, three. First step, if you can, if you feel up to it, call them, try to work something out with them. What can you do for me? You know, I can't afford that $122 payment. Can we reduce the interest? Can we work something out? The second step, if you can't do that or don't have a desire to do that and, and deal with it yourself, you can come to a nonprofit credit agency. There are programs called DMP, Debt Management. You'll see it on a credit report as credit counseling, where the entity you go to will renegotiate. I like to look at it like a modification for credit cards. So they're gonna look at your income, they're going to try to come up with a lower payment. They're going to what we call amortize it. So if you were paying $1,500 a month in credit cards, usually maybe $50 is going to the principal. This program will accelerate it, and within four to five years, you can pay off in full. And if you remember, by paying off the principal, the amount that you owe, quicker, your score will go up quicker. Now the third area, if that's not the program for you, then you'll see a bankruptcy attorney. And I don't know if Edwin's gonna speak quickly on bankruptcy, some of the differences, but there is life after bankruptcy and it is a viable option uh, many times to help people move forward. Um, I want Mikhail also to give them some idea. When you come to the lender, thank you so much guys. Um, when you come to the lender, what should they bring? What information are you gonna need from them? Yeah, sure. And don't forget, hold on just a second, don't forget if you write your questions down because everyone that has a question, you, have, you will have an opportunity to ask it if it's a general question. But if you have a certain situation, we have private rooms set up where you can go and talk to any one of us, well, them, because I can't tell you anything. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> In, you know, I think to start, I just wanted to, to piggyback on the credit card thing. Raise your hand if you have a credit card. Okay, yeah, we all do, I got a credit card. But you really gotta ask yourself why. Why do you have a credit card? You know, if you're using it for emergencies, if you're using it because you have a specific plan on how you're gonna build your credit, if you're just using it to try and make yourself happy, <laughs> for a good time, thank you for that, that was a good line. You're probably not using it for the right reasons. And my point is simply, when you want to become a homeowner or you want to own your own home, you got to really get yourself in the right frame of mind. you got to be ready to make the decision for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. You know, you're not trying to live up to a standard. You're not trying to do anything except for do the right thing. So be careful how you use your credit cards because it'll, it'll have a profound impact on your life. And credit cards really aren't, there's no reason to really use them unless, it, again, it's for emergencies or it's to satisfy a specific plan uh, that someone has helped or you've set forth for yourself. So uh, when you come visit me, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions about what your goals are and what you do and what you've done, and then I'm going to make you prove it. And this is where it gets really difficult and where you're, you're going to like me a lot, but you're not going to like me a lot at the same time. So you're going to bring things like, uh, first we're going to prove who you are. So you're going to bring driver's license, social security cards, um, passport if you need to. You're going to um, prove to me uh, where you work and how long you've worked there. And then um, you're going to, first you're going to give me pay stubs and then I'm going to pretend like I don't believe you and we're going to order verifications of employment. So your employer is going to tell me exactly how long you've worked there and how much money you make. Um, we're going to verify your income with your pay stubs, like I said, and the verification of employment. Then uh, how much money you've saved. You know, you're going you're gonna to be like, oh, Mikhail, I've got $10,000 in the bank. I'm good. Well, you're going to have to prove that. So you're going to show me the bank statements, the most two, two, re two most recent months. And, uh, and then we're going to verify those bank statements, right? So we're going we're gonna to hit up the bank and make sure that they're accurate and correct. Um... And then your debt, you know, we're going to run your credit. So all those debts that you told me you had or you didn't have, ultimately I'll know when I run your credit and we review it together. And uh, any delinquencies, any derogatory credit that's reported, 
any credit inquiries, you're going to have to explain all those and put it on, put it on paper why, why you got your credit checked 17 times in the last two, wait, two weeks. <laughs> you got to tell me. So that's, that's some of the stuff you're going to bring. And um, I wish I could say it stops there, but it doesn't. You know, once we get into the underwriting process, the underwriters, and does anybody know who an underwriter is or what an underwriter does? So an underwriter is the one that's, like, I don't really know anything. The underwriter knows it all, and I'm going to present to them your, your story, and, uh, uh, and the underwriter is going to evaluate it and make a determination. And oftentimes, they're going to ask for additional verification of what it is you've provided, what it is you produce, dis additional explanations. So that kind of gives you a little insight. All right. Okay, next we're going to have Edwin. Edwin Ferguson with the Ferguson Firm. All right. He's not only with the Ferguson Firm, he is, he the, is Ferguson the Ferguson Firm. firm. <laughs> Give the attorney a hand as he comes. Give all the panelists a hand. He doesn't do it by himself. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I've been listening to the presenters thus far, and hopefully what everyone is hearing from them is that purchasing a home is actually a business decision. It's an investment. It's not something that should be done from an emotional standpoint. It's not a recreational activity. Um, having said that, personally, I don't believe it's the most daunting thing that one can be involved in. Now, the, I'm coming from the standpoint of handling litigation, so some of you who may know me know that I've handled criminal cases in the past, wrongful death cases in the past. So from that standpoint, this endeavor is significantly less stressful from a standpoint of dealing with someone's passing or someone trying to avoid incarceration for extended periods of time. Having said all that, it is a business decision, but it's something that can be handled even for you as first time home buyers if you prepare properly and you prepare properly by anticipating the things that you need to have in place at the time of attempting to purchase the home. So we heard Mikhail say earlier um, about uh, providing proof of employment, proof of uh, verification of pay stubs, things of that nature. These are not things that should take you off guard at this point. If you're looking to purchase a home, uh, first thing I would probably recommend to you before you come to any of us is set out, set out a timeline, set out a date by which you like to get into a home, and then from there work back and set certain deadlines by which you have all the things that you need in place. So if, Mikhail, if you know that you're going to go to someone like Mikhail, and they're going to ask you for the last two months of a bank statement, if you're getting an assistance from a family member or favorite uncle or father or mother, what have you, have that money sitting in that bank account well in advance before you go there so that it's not as if you're trying to scramble at the last minute when Mikhail tells you, hey, I need your last 60 days worth of bank statements. Have that already in place. Um, Keith has already mentioned to you the importance of having as strong a credit score as possible. Specifically, it's relevant because of the fact that your interest rate, which Mikhail or someone in his his area of, of, of real estate um, is going to, to quote you, is going to be in part, if not totally related to uh, those type of things. So the higher your score, the lower your interest rate is likely going to be. That can result in you saving thousands of dollars. So again, if you set up a timeline and figure out a date by which you like to put down an offer on a home, some of these some of these encumbrances, some of these roadblocks, some of these headaches can be minimized. So keep that in mind. Now, as far as my services, yes, I'm an attorney. I've been practicing for 10 years. So I've seen pretty much every type of case that you can think of. Um, from the standpoint of real estate, I would say that the most important thing, again, for you as first-time homeowners is preparation, anticipation, um, and also looking at it from a very objective and business-like standpoint. Um, I think one of the speakers said earlier that people often do things back where they find the home and then they go try to find the financing and try to find someone to clear up the credit score. What I would say to you all is that no one home is that special. No one house is that special. So if the deal does not work for you and your budget, move on to another one um, from that standpoint. Because what I've learned in these 10 years is that it's actually relatively easy to get into a home, but it can be very difficult. I'm very stressful to you and your family to get out of the home if you don't get into it the right way. So it's very important to do things in order, do things from a very business um, and thoughtful uh, approach. Now, as far as how I can be of assistance to you as first home, first time home buyers. First, I think that something that often goes underutilized is legal services at the time of contracting with 
the person. So say you want to buy a home from John Doe. He's at 123 Main Street. Uh, it's right there on the corner of uh, Blue Heron and, and Congress. A beautiful home. Five-bedroom home, four bath, a pool in the back, fountain in the front. What, what a great deal. Um, you come to him, or Deborah, you, Deborah and you come to him, and you want to put down a contract on the property. Um, but he has certain requests or certain uh, provisions that he wants to put into that contract. But you're so in love with this particular property, you just sign off on it and say, great, here's my $30,000 deposit. We close in 30 days. Great. I have the financing. Let's go. Stop. I think that particularly you as a first time home buyer, it would be very helpful for you to have someone on your side who's gone through this issue before as far as from a litigation standpoint when things go bad. Because although everyone up on this panel would love for things to go smoothly for you, if something goes bad, who do I go to to help me get out of this situation or who can help me stop from getting into the situation in the first place? Again, I would say that utilizing legal services is something that you should strongly consider because if you sit down with an attorney that you feel comfortable with, you can walk through that contract page by page and ask them specific questions as far as what does this mean that I have 30 days to inspect the home? And what does this mean that uh, if I don't inspect the home um, but I don't close by a certain date that my deposit is not refundable and that it is forfeited to the seller? What does that mean? Well, that means that, that $30,000 that you saved up for um, scraped and borrowed and begged and whatever, however you came across it, is gone. Just as a matter of business, as a matter of contract. So now, what do I do? Well, now I guess you can pay another attorney or me to try to chase, chase that deposit down. I would encourage you not to do that. I would encourage you to take the time again to find someone that, that you feel comfortable with before you ever sign the contract and have them explain to you what the specific provisions of that contract mean. And then going into the uh, contract with more knowledge, you can feel comfortable that, okay, these are the deadlines by which I need to get things done. These, so if I'm trying to, say, finance this deal, say if you have a provision where the contract says you're going to buy the home for $100,000 and you are saying that it's contingent on me obtaining financing from Mikhail, Mikhail or someone else uh, by a certain day. But if I don't obtain that financing by a certain day, it converts to a cash deal. Now, what does that mean? It sounds just like what you can imagine. If you don't have the money on the day of closing, regardless of whether you were trying to get uh, financing from a bank or from a private lender or you were borrowing money from someone else, if you don't have that money, then your deposit is gone. Now, I keep, you notice I keep talking about deposits because in my experience, that seems to be the, the rub. Deals break down all the time, and that's why I'm saying to you, don't fall in love so much with a particular house. Fall into make the decision based on what's good for you and your family in 5 and 10 and 15 and 20 years. Because if it, it seems like gold today and then it comes, becomes a weight later, you'll forget about all that great feeling that you had at the day of closing when everybody's shaking hands and changing keys and taking Facebook and Instagram photos. I got my new house. Hooray. But now the summons, is, the summons has been brought to your door and the bank is saying you've missed the last couple of payments or whatever the case may be. I would submit to you that having someone on your side to break down some of those provisions in that contract up front, firstly, uh, can help you on the back end to make sure that you are comfortably owning this home and that is not always struggling to make ends meet because that is something that I've noticed whether we're talking about 10 years ago when the supposed bubble was about to pop or even during the uh, last, last big real estate craze here in the early 2000s, nobody really, I think everybody as a general rule did a poor job of figuring out what their exit strategy would be. They always assumed that things would continue up or that things would always work themselves out. And unfortunately, that's not the way of things. We all know that in life. So taking time to have somebody review the contract with you up front can be invaluable. Now, let's move beyond that, signing up or hiring the attorney of your choice. Now you're actually in the uh, deal. You signed the contract, the deposit has been placed down. Now what is most important is making sure that the person that you've contracted with actually owns a doggone thing. <laughs> because that does happen from time to time where you have dishonest people who will tell you that, oh, I own the property. No, you don't, your father owns the property. Or, whatever, or your father passed and you've not probated the estate, so technically it's owned by the estate. You may, have ultimately, you may have ultimately been the one that would be the 
title owner of the property, but you still haven't done the legal work up front to get it placed in your name. Or maybe it was only going to be parsed in your name and your sister was also going to be a co-owner. So you basically contracted with somebody who doesn't have full ownership of the property, um, and you're basically buying a, a, par a parcel inches of the property. Who wants to do that? Because you're still going to have to go back in there and get the deed from the other party. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? This is where we get into the whole issue of title, title work being done. Now, my office, we do that, but there are many other title companies in town, and you just want to make sure that you find someone who does things early as opposed to later. So in that regard, as a first-time home buyer, second-time home buyer, third, fourth, however many-time home buyer you may be, take note of this. Stay away from paper, sh paper shufflers, persons that when you come to their office can't seem to find your file. That is a notification that you need to take your business somewhere else because they're probably dropping the ball in more than one way. And when we're talking about title, you're going to a title company to make sure that one, the person that you have signed this contract with actually owns the property. And then two, once you all sign the, I'm sorry, when you go to closing and they hand you the keys and everybody's taking the photos for Instagram, Snapchat, and Facebook or whatever the case may be, that there's nobody that's going to come knocking on your door later regarding some debt that attached to that property. For example, a lot of people have had financial hardships in their life. They don't pay their federal taxes. And from time to time, the federal government will place a lien against them and it attached to all their properties in the county. Now, a good title company will bring that to your attention. And contractually, the seller is supposed to make sure that those type of things are taken care of before closing. But again, if your title company is not on the ball, something like that can fall through the crack. Now you're worried about, oh, shoot, IRS is calling me because this guy or this woman has still not paid their, their loan. And now they're looking to liquidate any assets that they owned at the time that the lien was recorded. Who wants to go through that headache? Who wants to beg Uncle Sam, please don't take my home from me, Uncle Sam. I'm sorry, I should have paid attention, but I didn't. It's business for them. It goes back to the whole theme of business. Everything that they've said to you before is all based on cut and dry. They like you, but it is business. The government, I would say, likes us all, but it is still business, too. We're supposed to pay our, our, our annual taxes, so if you don't, there are going to be consequences. What about the whole concept? I believe I heard someone, Miss uh, Commissioner Miller Anderson, speak about code enforcement. Oftentimes, there are liens that attach to properties that persons had no idea about because they're unrecorded. They're just, you would have to actually send a, a record request to the code enforcement department here in Riviera Beach, for example, or West Palm Beach to ask them if there are any unrecorded liens on that property for, say, not cutting the grass. Say the owner passed or the owner was very sick and didn't have anyone to cut the grass for him. And for whatever reason, code enforcement elected to, to cite them for that. And then they recorded a judgment against them at a $100 a day. Well, at a $100 a day tick, you can rack up a pretty substantial lien. And then when you start talking about interest, something that was initially a $200 lien for not cutting your grass 10 years later is worth substantially more. Technically, that type of thing needs to be clear before you step into that property. Because if it's not, guess whose responsibility it is to take care of that bag? You as the owner. So again, you want to make sure that your title agent is doing things sooner than later and doing things on a very thorough basis, which again, I guess, brings me back to having an attorney that's experienced in handling real estate because they can look at that preliminary title search with you to make sure that everything seems to be in order. You, you follow what I'm saying? If they're looking at that preliminary title search or also the laws are changing, but I'll still refer to it as the preliminary HUD to kind of let you know what, what the incoming monies are to help close and what the dispersion is going to be, they can, they can verify whether there was ever an unrecorded lien search done. Because again, you don't want to have a situation after the happy day, Facebook, Snapchat, and all these type of things where people come knocking at your door saying, by the way, I want you out of my house. What do you mean out of your house? I own this house. Or what do you mean that this person owed you $50,000 for not paying taxes 10 years ago? Or what do you mean that this person had an unrecorded lien for not cutting their grass that for whatever reason they didn't bring it to my attention or the title agents didn't bring it to my attention. What do you mean? These are things that you want to take care of as soon as possible so that once you're out of closing, the, the harmony that you would hope to have is what you can have. You follow what I'm saying? So now we've gone from, okay, I've spoken with an attorney up front. He or she has advised me as to what each of these paragraphs of this proposed contract means. So I feel relatively comfortable about that. And I have them on my side throughout this. We've also discussed this title, preliminary title search. So I feel pretty good that if we close on this property, 
it's going to be my property and nobody's going to come and bother with me after the fact, try to kick me out or say that I owe more money or whatever the case may be. Now we're at the day of closing. And again, fortunately, the laws have changed now so that things aren't as hectic as they used to be. Because although I am a person who likes to do things sooner than later, maybe because they have so many loans, a lot of times financial institutions won't give you your information to darn near the hour before closing. It's supposed to be 24 hours, but I've seen where basically they were, sent, they were sending me as a closing agent documents for the, um, the, the uh, buyer to look at on the day of closing. Well, how does that work? How can they thoroughly look through everything within the hour or two hours before closing or at closing? We would like to think that people can, but I, my experience, the more time you give a person to review something, the better likelihood they have of understanding something, the less likelihood they have of something falling through the cracks. You follow what I'm saying? Because then once you go to closing, once you sign, once everything's been recorded, you can't go back as a general rule and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not right. So now the laws are, are giving us a little more time where essentially everything should be soon. Every, every loan is going to basically have to be provided to you for your review three days in advance, which is a great thing. Again, that gives you more time for you and your team, which I would encourage you all to include a lawyer in that team, to review everything, to figure out what the legal significance of each document is so that there's no gray area in your mind. Everybody follow what I'm saying? So that's it as far as my spiel goes. I didn't have anything written down. I'm just speaking to you all from the experiences that I've, that I've dealt with um, in, in real estate purchases. It can be a very uh, enjoyable thing. It definitely is a great feeling, just like buying a new car, buying a new home. Anything new is always great, but it needs to have that staying power. So for it to have that staying power, it's very important for each of you to take the time to strategize when, when you want to get into a home and then take care of those other preliminary things that the other speakers have already spoken about regarding making sure your credit is as strong as it can be, uh, making sure that you have all your finances in place, and then bringing an attorney that you trust onto your team and asking them those hard questions. Don't be ashamed about it. You're, they're not probably doing it for free. So don't be shy about whether you're a first-time homeowner or a second-time homeowner, asking them the questions that you need answered so that you feel comfortable because going in, during, and after closing, you should be as comfortable as possible. All right? So I'm going to I'm going to cut it short. I'm not as long winded as I guess people think attorneys are, but I, I just like to kind of cut to the point. But I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that any of you may have um, later this evening. Thank you. OK, we're not going to let him go that fast. So, Edwin, can you give them some idea? Because we also have some first time home sellers here. What is your part as far as the seller? What? I'm sorry. What is my what? What? Um, what is the process that you use when you're working with a seller? Generally, in Palm Beach County, the seller is the party that will determine who the closing agent is. So in that, in that regard, if the seller is the one bringing, bringing the deal to me, it, it really works the same. There, it really makes no difference. So let me back up. If they're, if they're only asking me to serve as the closing agent, then the things that I, that I always do are we give you a preliminary report, generally within 48 hours of us receiving the contract. So that everybody knows what liens are on the property, because remember, it's generally going to be the seller's responsibility to get all that cleared up at or before the time of closing. Um, if there is any contract, of course, I would assume all parties have it. But just in case they don't have a copy of it, I don't know when that would actually happen. I just make a general rule to send it out via email to everyone. Um, as we get up up to closing, I try to keep everybody seller or buyer. It really doesn't matter as a closing agent. I'm, rep I'm, I'm there providing a service for all parties, so it's not as if I'm on one party's team and not the other. I'm just kind of impartial, and I'm trying to make sure that we get the job done. Just updating everybody to let them know, okay, we have the survey in. So you send the survey uh, to both parties. Uh, if we have an unrecorded lien search, which we wouldn't necessarily have at fr up front, uh, for example, in Riviera Beach, and they're pretty quick, actually, compared to some of the other municipalities, in my experience. We are very quick. <laughs> right. We are the county leader there. Well, they're pretty quick. <laughs> I'll say that. And they are one of the best. Um, but the point is they normally will get us a response as to if there are any unrecorded liens on the property within seven days. So, again, at some point within week one to two, you should have a full understanding as to what liens are on that property. Why is that important? Because you should have it written in your contract. I guess I'm doubling back to buyers, but you're asking from the seller. Um, but assuming that the buyer has an attorney uh, on their team, 
they should have they're going to still be within that 30 day window where they can just cancel the deal without any recourse. They can say, you know what? I don't like this home. It's painted blue. I want a pink house. So they give you written notice and just cancel the deal and you get your deposit back and go find that other house that you want. Um, I don't know how else to answer that question other than how I just said it. That's fine. So if, if, if the seller were, if I were representing the seller, then we're making sure that we get everything uh, done as quickly as possible. They're not necessarily going to have questions regarding the, the significance of the mortgage documents, if you will, and some of the other affidavits and things that a buyer might have. So from that regard, a seller, a seller is going to probably have less of a need for an attorney from the standpoint that they're doing a finance deal as opposed to one where they may be maybe holding the mortgage for the buyer or if it's a cash deal. Um, so it really, that kind of is a specific thing. Uh, it kind of actually stumped me for a moment. Um, that's, that's about all I can say about that, though. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so we have gotten ourselves to a point where we're credit worthy. We've gone to the bank and we've gotten our money. We have um, spoken to the attorney, so he already knows that you're going to be in, bring in a contract soon for him to look over for you. You want to make sure that he has time for you, right? Well, then you're going to talk to me or someone like me. And I want you to first understand there is a difference between a real estate agent and a realtor. Does anybody know, um, does anybody think that they're the same thing? A realtor or a real estate agent? They basically do the same thing. Um, the difference between a real estate agent and a realtor is that a realtor has a code of ethics which, way, which they abide by. So it's a higher standard of excellence. It's a higher standard of integrity in dealing with your business, your home, your information, everything that goes along with your transaction. So when you're dealing with a realtor, they have higher guidelines that they have to follow. So just understand that, okay? Now, you, a lot of times, like they said before, a lot of times when um, a person comes to me as a buyer, they come to me, they already have some idea of a house They've been looking at houses. They've been online day and night, day, night and day, and they've found two houses that they just absolutely love. Well, first, I want you to stop and consider what are the things that you must have in a home. You've got your money. You know how much money you can afford. You want to know where you want to be because it's wide open. If you want to say Palm Beach County, Palm Beach County is huge. So you have to choose an area that you would like to be in. That's important. I like to say that you want to have your five must-haves. So your area might be one of those must-haves, but you definitely want to know what area you want to be. And you also want to know what it is that you're looking for in a house, what you need in the house. When I first got married, when I was 20 years old, okay, I was really young. I was too young when I got married. Um, but my husband and I, we rented a house, and it was a one-bedroom house. It had a eat-in kitchen and a, a living room. And there was one thing about that house that I did not like. It was the sink in the kitchen was just a single sink. It drove me crazy. It wasn't a lot of counter space on beside that. So when I left out of the house, the next house that we were going to look in, one of my must-haves, which was at the top of the list, was that that kitchen had to have a double sink. That was one of my must-haves. So whatever your must-have is, write it down, whether it's a fenced yard, whether it needs to be on a corner lot, whether it needs to be in a gated community, whatever those must-haves are for you, you want to identify those. And sometimes if you write them down, sometimes you have to go back and look at it because you look at a house and you, th you think that you like it, but it doesn't have all of your must-haves. Then you want to look at and ask yourself, okay, was this really a must-have or this, was this a want? So you have your wants and then you have your must-haves. If you have something on your must-have that you realize is a want, move it over, put it in the other column. This is just a want because I don't have to have this. So when you go out looking for the properties that um, those things are you're identifying. And the first thing before you even going out looking at properties, um, a lot of agents want to, they'll take the time and you know get what your must-haves are and then they'll go online and looking for your 
three bedroom, two bathroom house with a fence yard, two stories or a single story, whatever it is that you're looking for and find what's available. Sit down at the computer, go through the picture, see what you like, what you don't like, kind of skim through it really quickly. And this is the process that I use. Everyone doesn't use it the same way. It's very different. Um, but going through the process and finding out, narrowing it down, because there's thousands and thousands of houses on the market. So you want to narrow it down and find those houses that you want to funnel it down, drill it down to what you want, what you're going to like when you get there. Now, sometimes when you look at a house, the pictures look great. Move in ready. And then you get there. And it's not. <laughs> So you don't want to fall in love with a house on, on paper. You don't want to fall in love with it. You want to get out there, take a look at it. And I want you to also, when you go, you want to take your notes. Don't look at too many. More than six houses in a day is way too much to look at. If you sit down and you take the time, like with these, if you put in the foundation, you get the foundation of everything you need, then it's gonna go, the process will go a whole lot easier. If you have Macau's paperwork ready when you get there, Mikhail, I've got this, I've got that, I've got that. Everything that you've gotten, you already knew that you needed, you already have it ready, so this process is going to be a lot smoother. Um, so when you're looking for the house, once we sat down and we've gone through your five must-haves, we know what area you want to be in, we go through the computer, we pick out six houses that you want to go and see because you know that they're, um, they fall in the criteria that you're looking for. Then we go out there and take a look at your house. Don't be surprised if you find it the first day because you did the homework, because the foundation was set. You're not just going out, running around, looking. You know, gas has come down, but don't matter, nobody wants to be running around wasting gas looking at houses that we're not going to buy, right? Um, but the process of buying real estate is very simple. Once you locate the house, the hardest part is you figuring out your must-haves. So once you locate the house and we're putting an offer to the seller, the seller's agent, and it's, it's a good idea to be working with a real estate agent versus dealing with a homeowner one-on-one -on -one because you need that middle person. Emotions sometimes can get flared. They can say something the wrong the way when you go and see the house, you may say something that uh, was insult to them because they love this house. You know, it's very good um, for a seller and those of you who are sellers. If you have someone coming to look at the property, you don't want to be there while they're looking. You want to step aside. Let them look at it freely. Let them have their opinions so they can express what it is that they feel and what they like and what they don't like and reasons why. It may not be that they don't like the color. It may be that the color is um, they like it better in another room, or they don't like the floor plan, whatever it is. You just want to be separate, and that's how working with a real estate agent on both sides of the transaction is good, and it keeps the heat, keeps the, um, the emotions down. Because we take some, we take, we buffer that. We take some of that frustration. It can be very, very stressful, but it doesn't have to be. If you're prepared and you know what you have to do ahead of time, if you've taken those steps and you, you know that, okay, this is what I've got to do next. When you got your driver's license, you know that you had to learn how to drive. You know you had to study these questions. You know you had to go that, right? You know you had to do that, right? So when you went and you asked, you said, I want to get my license. Well, they're going to put you in a car and you're going to have to drive it. You're not going to be surprised. Right? So the process with a, with a real estate, um, with purchasing a real estate, a home, is the same thing. Hold on just one minute. Um, just hold your point. The first five people that have questions, if you can just start going towards the, uh, the, uh, the podium here. If you have questions uh, that are general questions for information purposes, again, we'll have the um, private time where you can talk to any one of the uh, panelists. But if you just have a question, for your benefit and for others, please go to the podium as Deborah um, wraps up, um, and that way you'll already be there. Okay, go ahead. Right, so you guys do not be afraid to ask a question, and no question is a dumb question. Because if you don't understand, if you don't know, then you cannot move forward. We stop when we don't, have, when we don't understand what we need to do or where we need to go. 
A lot of you would have purchased homes way back when if you had the information, if you knew what you needed to do, or you knew how to get the information. So if you have a question, please, please ask it. Okay, you finished? Yeah, I, I didn't fine. mean to cut that's you off. Fine. Were that's you good? Fine. Okay, good. Okay, we're getting ready to go to the uh, question and answer, but I have a question um, yes. for Ms. McLaughlin. McLaughlin? McLaughlin? McLaughlin. Okay, I'm close. <laughs> a real estate agent is different from a realtor, correct? You said? Yes. Okay. And you said one because the, the realtor, the, the code of ethics is different. The real estate agent does not necessarily have to abide by a code of ethics. Well, what does they have they to don't, abide by then? They just do what they want to do. Okay, no, there are what, rules what and there are laws that they follow, but the code of ethics is a higher standard. Okay, well, it's higher in what way? Is it, is it a higher certification or... Is there a different, I'm trying to see the difference because there is I, I don't want real, real estate agents to get upset with us and <laughs> say that we put them under the bus. So I, w I want you to. All real estate agents can become realtors. They have to go through the code of ethics and that is what separates. So um, there's another level of training that correct. they have to get it's to. Correct, it's another level of training that you have to go. And, and there's a continuing education that they'd have to go through as oh, well for that. Okay. All right, sir, your name and then ask your General question. Yes, uh, my name is Charles Paldo. I actually, Charles Paldo, I actually had two questions, but in addition to that, that question that you had to her, a real estate agent is under a realty, is it not? Yes, a real estate company. A, a real estate a company. Broker. So if that real estate agent was to, you know, for, for sake, be fraudulent or anything, then that realty, you know, you know what I'm saying, is liable for that, right? Uh, or should be? Yeah, I think the answer, I think the answer to your question is um, a real estate agent and a realtor both have to be licensed. Under a realtor. In order to practice. And um, if you're just a real, real estate agent or a realtor, you, you, um, you do have to hang your license under a licensed broker. So okay. a broker is going to have more experience in the industry. They have to have a minimum of two years of real estate experience before they can go to continued education and pass an additional exam to become a broker. Okay. So yeah. That question. helps me. That, that, that helped me out. <laughs> it really did. That's a good I know question. There was something I didn't hear, but you know, exactly. I heard it. Uh, okay. The main yeah. question is for Keith. Um, when you made the statement about um, collection and, and collection activity and uh, the old debts that go away after seven years, if you have a debt for six years, 11 months, in three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, then it nice. gets sold to another entity. Does indeed that start that seven years over? Because entities are telling me, oh, well, no, it started over seven. Is, it, is that true in, you know, based on what your experiences is? Well, my understanding is that they're going to use the date of last activity on the account by a creditor selling the debt that is not part that is not an activity so in theory it does not start a new seven year period and to elaborate on that i believe what's happening in that situation is the initial creditor who you haven't paid for seven years is going to make one last ditch effort to try and make some money on that account right. so they'll sell that account for, for a very small amount of money to a company who's willing to gamble that they're going to be able to get you to pay that money back. So they make that call it's a business and then decision. that starts the last. That does not reset the clock for seven years. It shouldn't, though. right? Okay. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of something that we can contest if it does appear on your credit report. Thank you for your Good question. question. Thank you. Good question. Thank you. However, if you do make a payment, that does start the seven years old. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. <laughs> All right, next uh, questioner. Good Anybody evening. else just go over to, for we can just move on with time. Go ahead. Good evening. My question is, um, do you all work with any particular agencies or companies to help you find a house? Like sometimes the city may have programs that they actually work with to help you um, find houses or basically you're on your own with this? That's the job of the real estate agent. Do you do down payment assistance? 
Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What as it's far as you asking, is there any help available for people to uh, for down payment assistance or first time holder grants? Or any is that your question? There's a lot. I'll, of I'll respond to that. Oh, great. Okay. That, hold on. Is that your question though? I want to make sure we ask responding to the right question. Partly, I mean, like, do you have program in the city? Like, I know the cities have had programs before, like um, infill housing programs or uh, Brooks subdivision programs or something that the city was offering to help people in the community if they wanted to, you know, try and be a home, uh, first time home buyer with them? You could work with a real estate agent or a realtor and they can help you to locate the home. The lenders um, also will help you deal with the programs as far as um, any down payment assistance or any credit um, as far as monies that would allow you to get into that program. That's part of their job. But as far as the real estate agent, as far as who would help you locate your house and find your house, that would be me, the real estate agent or the realtor. And I'll elaborate on the second part of your question there. If, so when you're looking for different types of programs to help you become a, a home buyer, there are uh, local, regional, and statewide programs, and there's even a couple of national programs out there that can help you with things such as down payment assistance. That's a big one. Um, the program that we most often use is, and I'll elaborate on that quickly, is uh, offered by a company called the Florida Housing Corporation. And this is a um, uh, organization that offers first-time homebuyer down payment assistance uh, year-round. So the funding is year-round for that program. And you can get up to $7,500 towards down payment and closing cost assistance. The way it works is it's not exactly free money. It's a bond. And that bond, that $7,500, is added to your uh, property as a second lien. And it sits there. doesn't incur any interest. You don't make any payments on it can sit there for up to 30 years before you have to pay it back. The same program, the Florida Housing Corporation offers a grants program where you can get up to 3% of the purchase price of your home. So if you buy a $200,000 home, you can get up to $6,000 in down payment and closing cost assistance. Um, that money is free. You don't pay that money back. It's grant money. Um, there's also a tax credit program offered through them. It's called MCC. And this program can help get you an additional $2,000 tax credit each year, which is, um, which is also a nice benefit. Um, so those programs are piggybacked on top of traditional loan programs like FHA, conventional loans, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's three minimum requirements. The first one is you have to have a 640 credit score. The second one is that your combined household income, and that includes anyone that lives in your house who works, that combined household income has to be less than 75000 a year. That number varies a little bit depending on the county you're in, but 75 is a good number to kind of base your initial uh, determination off of. And then the last thing is you have to be a first-time home buyer, which means you haven't had a vested interest in real estate for the last three years. You haven't owned it. You haven't been on title. You haven't. Um, and now that last one is waived if you're a veteran. You can actually take advantage of this program anytime as a veteran whether you're a first-time home buyer or not, which is pretty cool. And if I could Did just, we answer your question? If I could just add a little bit to that, because there are a lot of programs that are available. Some are publicized better than others. So I always say we have DPAs, we have MCCs, and we have IDAs. What do those acronyms stand for? I'll get to that. The DPAs is down payment assistance. Mikhail uh, just spoke about one from the state of Florida. A lot of cities and counties also have down payment assistance programs, so you'll have to speak with them. The ones that I've run across are unfortunately, or, or fortunately for the people in Miami, it's more Miami-Dade County than Palm Beach. We get left out a little bit on those. The... <clears throat> Uh, MCC is the mortgage credit certificate where you can get a tax credit on your federal tax return. So it doesn't help you buy the house. It helps you pay less in taxes on your income tax. So you'll have more money to be able to afford the house. IDAs are independent development accounts, and they're starting to come out more and more. 
And that's a matching fund. Some of the banks are coming out saying, if you open up a bank account, put in a dollar, we'll give you a dollar to match to go towards it. So these are programs. I'm trying, it happens to be one of my little personal crusades, to put the resource together because there really isn't one good location. I did come across one website, downpaymentresources.com, that is trying to do this on a nationwide basis. So you put in your address, where you live, answer a few questions, and they will tell you what they know is available. It's not a complete list, but it's a start. Give it to us one more time. The web Sure. Downpaymentresource.com. Of course, www.downpaymentresource.com. There's another really great website, too, when you're done writing that one down. Um, for local programs, and oftentimes these programs are defunded, so you need to really put a lot of pressure on your legislators to work to get these programs refunded because they're extremely important for the redevelopment of our local communities. So they're called the SHIP program, S-H-I-P, and they're funded by the state, but they're just... Um, managed and distributed by the counties. Mm -hmm. And the website is uh, www.ircdd.com. And you can, you can often view, well, I'm sorry? I sure can. It's um, I-R-C-C-D-D. C-C-D-D, right? Yep, like there you go, C-C-D-D. That was like a movie, right? Double C, <laughs> double D. Um, so you can find out more about the SHIP program it's kind of like wildfire. As soon as they're funded, there's like a first come first serve mentality for those programs. So you got to be really connected to when and how and why and what do I do to take advantage of those funds. Your lenders are not going to help you with those programs. Those are self initiative type programs. Okay. The other one I spoke about earlier, we help you with. Thank you. Okay. okay thank you. Next person. Anyone else? Thanks for your question. Yeah, that was a good one. one. Great question. Good evening, my name is Sarita. I had a, two questions. The first question is for, I believe, Keith. Um, as Which, far as well, this- Hold on, who's Keith? I'll be Keith. You know, y'all look alike, I'm so I'm trying guy, to figure yeah. out. <laughs> the credit guy. My brother right, from another Keith. mother. Brother, that's right. <laughs> um, as far as the state of Florida's statute of limitations for creditors, will the DMP agencies help you understand what harassment is? and how you would go about filing or complaining, making a complaint as far as a creditor that is harassing you to get some things taken care of on your credit? Uh, I think your question may be more in line of a legal question. Oh, okay. If a collector is violating the Fair Debt Collection Act, yes, then you may have legal recourse. Then okay. I would advise you to speak with an attorney. Okay. I don't know that answer yeah, off the top a, of my head because that's not an area of law that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay. But it's a very specialized has, area. Mm -hmm. Right. If anyone has questions, uh, regardless of whether I can handle it for you or I know a number of attorneys in town, feel free to contact me at my office. The number is 561-840-1846. 561-840-1846. Yeah, and there are certain hours that they're allowed to call. There are certain number of phone calls per day certain number. Uh, you also have certain rights that you can ask them not to call you at work because it's impeding your income. Mm -hmm. uh, legal aid may have some information on it. Okay. So that might be another good resource. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Mikhail. What is your insight as far as USDA loans, as far as rural I'm saying that word right, rural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, hard word, areas. I can't yeah. have a hard time with it too. What is the benefit, um, for example, outside of Stewart mm -hmm. um, in some of those areas like that? Are you getting more of, is it more bang for your buck? Or are they just trying to populate those areas with um, good households? I don't know. What's yeah. the benefit of it? USD loans are awesome. They're, they're an amazing product. You can actually get into a property with zero money down. Interest rates are highly competitive. The challenge is that it's not really offered anywhere that we live around here. <laughs> right. Um, it is designed for rural areas, mm -hmm. and uh, the, po the, the idea is to help populate those areas to get people into homes. Um, 
started out, I, I believe it started out by helping farmers, you know, get, get into homes. And so it's a cool program. Now you can go to the USDA website and I believe it's USDA.gov and you can view maps right on there and it'll show you boundary lines and maps of where properties that are located within that boundary are eligible. Okay. Um, there's also uh, income re restrictions. Re you know, you can only make so much money to qualify kind of thing. And um, I don't do a ton of those, but I have all the resources at my fingertips, so I can definitely help you with that if you feel like you're going to purchase in an area <laughs> that, uh, that falls into the map boundaries. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Thank, yep. you. Thank you. And while the next young lady is coming, can someone just tell me quickly about the, the advantages or disadvantages of rent to own? I mean, that's, I yeah. see a lot of signs out. Rent yeah, to own. so rent to own, under certain circumstances, rent to own is, is, is good. You know, if you don't have good credit, but you're doing your due diligence to fix it, if you um, ha don't really have a lot of money saved, and you can find a rent to own scenario where you don't need a lot of money to put down, um, but just be careful. Understand that when an owner makes a business decision to rent to own to you, what they're really betting on most times is that you're going to default, you know, that you're not going to live up to the obligation and, and they're going to make money. They're going to charge you a premium in interest. They're going to charge you a premium in monthly rental payments. So those are things you should look out for. Yeah. Those you are the things you, you should look out happen. for, for sure. Yeah. And then I, you definitely, before you get into a rent to own, get this attorney involved and make sure that he is looking over every contract with a fine tooth comb or any attorney, right? That can yeah, I was going to say I don't, I'm not necessarily an opponent of leasing a property with the option to buy at some point in the future. But again, similar to what I said before, it needs to be a calculated business decision on your part. If you realistically think this is a property that you want to live in for the next 5, 10, 15 years, then it's probably not a bad idea to try to lock it in by way of the contract. If you foresee yourself having the necessary funds to obtain financing or to pay it in cash. Uh, at some point in, say, 24 months or 36 months. So I'm not necessarily an opponent of it. But to Mikhail's point, you want to make sure that the deal works for you. So know what you're getting into before you get into it. Because uh, a lease option is not the end of the world as far as getting into a bad loan, per se. But if, it's, if your intent was to purchase that property at a point in the future, 24 months or 36 months down the road, and now you realize because of your lack of diligence to investigate it before you got into the property that is not the property for you, then in many ways you've kind of wasted time investing in a property that you no longer want to have any dealings with. So just again, go into every situation with a business mind and be very cold and calculated from that standpoint before you put your John Hancock on any, on any uh, contract. Okay, young lady, thank you for being so patient with us. I think my question would be best answered by Mikhail. Do you have any experience with underwriters who don't use your credit score? Is anybody have any experience? Because I'm a big fan of Dave Ramsey, and he didn't mention it before, try to find an underwriter that may or may not use your credit score. Do you have any experience with that? No, no, because um, underwriters are very black and white for the most part. They're going to look at um, the regulations that are defined by organizations like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. These are two organizations that the <clears throat> government helps to support who buy, who purchase mortgages in the secondary market. Um, so underwriters are going to look at things in a very black and white world. I can tell you that um, most companies who you're going to apply for mortgages with, the underwriter carries a big stick. And if the underwriter makes a decision that you don't qualify, you're pretty much dead in the water. I can tell you at Movement Mortgage, we do things a little differently. We have about 250 underwriters total in our company, and not a single one of those underwriters can deny a file. Not a single one can deny a loan. What we do is we spend a lot of money every year to have what we call a loan committee. So any, any file that's de that, that is potentially going to be denied by an underwriter, all they can do is recommend it to loan committee. Loan committee is made up by highest level underwriters, experience, upper level executives in our company, and they, they go over every recommended file to loan committee with a fine tooth comb. And their whole mission in life is to figure out a way to make it work. And um, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. And we, with the majority of the loans that go to loan committee, um, they, get, they get turned over. They get approved because we really dive deeper into it. 
if I can just add to that real quickly. Okay, we're going to be wrapping up in five minutes, so go ahead. Okay. There is something called alternate credit. So certain again. alternate credit where you can sometimes use an insurance payment, a telephone bill, sometimes utilities, sometimes rent is not showing on your credit report. But there are some simple ways to get a credit score, uh, and you can develop lines of credit that way. So I may have misunderstood you. your question, if that's well, what you were asking. He, he, he always speaks about not using credit, not, not having credit, and that there may be ways to purchase a house without having a credit. I'm familiar with that, but generally I've seen investors use that, and it's generally not advisable, particularly for a property that you're trying to stay in, because you can have um, independent persons, smaller business entities, if you will, that will lend you money without knowing your credit, but the way they kind of balance the risk out from their standpoint is that they charge you probably twice, if not three times, what a conventional lender would charge you from, from an interest standpoint. And the length of the loan is going to be much shorter. So at some point, you're still going to have to probably go to someone in McHale's area that's going to rely on that credit report or your, your credit score to determine what the appropriate interest rate is, because it, it really is their way of balancing against your default. You know, if you have a poor score, your interest rate is higher. If you're good and you've not had a late payment in the last 30 years, your interest rate is lower. I know. They well, need he to mentioned it, and I'm like, why, why doesn't everybody you, do that? To, to, add, to add to that it's very briefly, th there, are, um, there are loan programs available that I can offer you that use alternative trade lines. Gotcha. So if you, if you have truly never used credit, and when we pull your score, it's, there's no score for all three categories, then we can establish alternative trade lines, which would be cell phone bills, utility bills, Student loan, or not student loan, but um, uh, what's another good one? Medical. Furniture. Anything that's not reported on your credit report that you've consistently paid on for the last 12 months. It's a good way to kind of define it. And it's, we recommend that, or well, you can have no debt, but still have a credit score. Okay. So Very few people don't, do not have a credit score. You know. If you pay off your credit cards, don't close them. And I'll recommend that you use them every now and then. Go buy a shirt and pay it. All right. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank Good you. questions. We, we, we're going to wrap up now. Um, and after we, well, after the conclusion of the wrap up, these gentlemen and um, the young lady will be in a private room, and you'll be able to go and talk to them on a one-to-one -one basis on your your personal situation if you have time tonight. Um, and if not, um, you can reach. Keith, is in it? You Keith, can, Keith, at? You can reach me at 800-920. Oh. Okay, I'll maybe. start again. 800-920-2262. And I am at extension 8037. Okay. Mikhail, uh, strongly encourage you to go to movement.com. You'll have a good time learning more about what we're all about. And I can be reached at 561-275-9200. 561-275-9200. Okay. Attorney uh, Ferguson. Uh, for the local residents, you can just go to West 27th Street between the Popeyes and the old Dairy Bell. <laughs> <laughs> and my office is right over there. And uh, bring him some those, lunch when you come. No, uh, no. <laughs> But for those who are Popeye chicken, huh? but for those who are watching, uh, you can reach me via telephone at five six one eight four zero one eight four six. And social media. And also, you can reach me via my Facebook fan page at the Ferguson Firm, or you can reach us via email at contact c o n t a c t at thefergusonfirm dot net. But again, for my local residents, I would feel free to stop by any day between on Monday Monday through Friday between eight thirty and five if you have a question. Uh, we're there to help you. 41 West 27th Street. Thank you. And Ms. McLaughlin, and you're a realtor. You, if you need your services. Yes, my name is Deborah McLaughlin. And like I told you, I'm from Georgia. Um, my phone number is 404-503-5110. You can also reach me on Facebook at Homes by McLaughlin. Or you can look my name up. I'm on there, both personal and business. Deborah, D-E-B-R-A. McLaughlin is M-C-G-L-O-T-H-U-R-N. And I do have cards over there on the table if you'd like to get one. Um, but if you all have any other questions, we will kind of um, be around here for a minute. And, and then if we need to do some one-on-one, -on -one, we'll step aside um, to do that. But we will stay here 
um, for a moment if you have any questions. Okay, let's give all of our panelists a hand. I'd like better. to also thank go. all of them for coming out for me. It's coming. The, um, the market has really been busy lately, so every one of these guys are un incredibly busy right now, so I appreciate them all coming out. And let me do a disclaimer, and then we're, we're, we're finishing in about one minute. A disclaimer as relates to the city of Riviera Beach. Um, the panelists, we're not endorsing any, either one. It's saying this is what the city sanctions. These are people who have come to share their expertise and experience, and there are many lawyers, there's many other relatives or other kinds of people that's doing the same kinds of things, so you choose whoever, but we want to uh, thank them for coming and sharing, and feel free to contact them as well. Um, that's the disclaimer from the uh, City of Riviera Beach. Also, a quick announcement, there's a free foreclosure prevention workshop. If you're delinquent on your mortgage payments, you received a foreclosure notice, don't know what to do, have you, have you decided to sell, we may be able to help, join us. You can speak one-on-one -on -one with a certified housing counselor to explore options, available programs, reduce wages, laid off for excessive debts, and that's going to take place every last Saturday of the month, the time 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the location at thedebthelpthere.com, and they're located at 1325 North Congress Avenue, uh, Suite 201, that's upstairs in the Chase Building, West Palm Beach. Phone number is 561 472 uh, 8,000. That's every last Saturday of the month for information that may um, save you one way or the other. Last but not least, don't forget that uh, we are preparing to go to Nassau, Bahamas, to go to the islands over there to take items that are desperately needed as we speak. Please get them to one of the fire stations right on the property here, City Hall or either Singer Island. They need water, uh, linen, and personal hygiene items. Um, please help us because we never know when we may need help. Thank you for coming. If you want to find the mayor, I'm up, I'm right here. Thank you. The best is yet to come. Come on up. Thank you.